Hello, my name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode five of Antidote, the show that introduces you to the people you need to know and the stories you need to hear in the 21st century. Invasive species pose a threat to ecosystems everywhere, but the state of Florida is ground zero. Today, we're going to meet a man who can tell us firsthand about the problems these animals pose by being in places where they don't belong, but by no fault of their own. Captain Jeffrey Fobb, welcome to Antidote. Thank you for having me. Captain Fobb, last year in July of 2014, you were featured in the opening paragraphs of this cover story on uh, Time Magazine about invasive species. That had to feel good to have your, your work uh, shown and respected in this manner in, in such a major periodical. It's certainly not something you expect when you do uh, the sort of work that I do. So it, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was appreciated. I thought it was a good article, too, here, so I have to give a shout-out to this, this author, Brian Walsh. The story opens with you teaching him how to capture the Burmese pythons, which are going to be a large portion of what we discussed today. But um, first, let's talk about what you do. You are in the Venom Response Unit of the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. How long have you been doing this, and what does your job generally entail? I've worked in, in this unit for six years. I've been with the fire department for 16. And um, my job generally entails dealing with animal related calls. It leaves uh, frontline units available to deal with uh, human emergencies. And your station is outside of Miami. You're in Homestead, is that correct? Uh, well, our, our office is in Tamiami. It's at the Tamiami airport. Okay, all right. Um, I've been following the invasive species story for several years now. I find it fascinating. And, you know, a lot of people talk about global warming, climate change, but mankind is also changing the planet by being a human vector for transporting animals into territories where they are not indigenous. Um, these animals, the Burmese pythons in particular, have been very successful in South Florida. And when I've been following these stories, I've heard numbers that vary wildly. I've heard numbers having the population in South Florida as low as a few thousand to as high as 150,000. In your opinion, what do you think is your best guess at how many of these animals there really are? It's probably somewhere in the thousands, 150,000. I'm not sure where that number originated. I know the initial estimate was very wide, but that's because they had very low confidence in how accurate it was. There's no way really to survey these animals well because they're relatively in, undetectable. I think detection rates are as low as 1%, and that's even for people who are trained to find them. They're uh, very well camouflaged. And in the Everglades area, uh, including the National Park and the National Preserve, there's about 3 million acres, and that's a huge land area. I think that's one of the things that people aren't, don't, can't really wrap their heads around when it comes to population estimates. But at the from... Uh, an estimate perspective, it's probably in the thousands, and uh, and from a practical perspective, I mean, how many do we need in the Everglades, and that number would be zero. Right. And this is a breeding population. This is, um, you know, there have been theories about how these snakes came to get there, but this is an ongoing breeding population. And you know what? You got to my follow-up question about the estimates, because one of the things that was going through my mind when I would read these stories is, okay, so how do you... How do, how do we estimate how many of these snakes there are? And you just said it is a uh, very uncertain science. So we really don't know. No, we don't. But I mean, uh, when we look at what we find outside and, and also the population is going to uh, fluctuate. It's going to go up and down. After 2010, the population probably decreased significantly. That's when we had uh, about seven days of uh, quite cold weather, uh, below freezing or freezing. Uh, and uh, a lot of animals suffered and died during that period. It, uh, invasives and some natives had pushed a crocodile population. We have native crocodiles here, and they were pushed quite a bit back from where they'd extended their range up into the central Florida, you know, the, along the coasts. And it did the same thing to the Burmese pythons, the, the ones that did not survive. And, you know, it's, we can't even estimate that. We can look, go and look for carcasses, but you're not always going to be successful finding them because they're going to die and wherever they happen to be, and it's not always going to be in the open. Um, but that affected the population. We saw a decrease in, in animals for a short period of time, and, and the numbers are starting to recover again because we haven't had that same cold cold weather. That was uh, like a, 
an event that would only happen every 70, 70 years or so. I remember reading about that uh, out here for some unusual reasons that we're going to talk about towards the end of this interview, uh, having to do with the, uh, the the iguanas as well. But the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, not only did they mention these Burmese pythons, but uh, other reptiles of concern, they talked about African rock pythons, amethysine pythons, reticulated pythons, green anacondas. How often do you encounter these animals, the non-Burmese pythons? Well, Burmese pythons form the bulk of the animals that we recover, the non-native animals that are part of a breeding population. Uh, and African rock pythons, northern African rock pythons, are breeding in a very, very small area. And that area is uh, subject to surveys and uh, frequent... Uh, uh, people run routes through there looking to see if they find roadkill animals or, or live animals. I mean, it's a, there's a concerted effort there to identify that population and remove what they can. Understood. There's also a lot of construction there, and construction, honestly, is not normally an asset to the environment, but in this case it is because that asset destroys habitat in which they might uh, take refuge and not be difficult to find, and it also causes some mortality when animals who are hiding in there while it's still intact are, are uh, injured or killed by heavy equipment. All of these giant constrictor snakes that we're talking about, to be clear, these are non-native animals. And I've been reading you know, for years the theories on how these large snakes came to inhabit South Florida. And I, I talked to you briefly on the phone about this, but for our audience, I will apprise them one of the theories was that in 1992, when they had Hurricane Andrew, that it, uh, you know, it, it destroyed pet stores, and I guess some of these animals got loose. The other idea is, and I find this probably valid, is that people let loose voluntarily these animals whom they can no longer um, take care of. But you brought up another option, which kind of blew me away, and I was not anticipating. Do you remember what that was, what you told me about how they might get out there? Yeah, people who release them purposefully so that they can find them in the wild. I mean, people people do strange things, things that are wildly inappropriate in, in retrospect that may seem like a good idea at the time. We have pigeons that are established here, starlings, uh, English house sparrows, and a few other birds that were released on purpose. Uh, we have wild pigs that were brought here on purpose for food, and now they they you know they run they run around wild pretty much pretty much everywhere. So. Mm -hmm. That's a potential vector for those animals to get here, and it could be any number of contributors. There may not be one reason why they're here. It may be uh, multiple reasons or maybe multiple causes for their population to become established. But the bottom line is they're not native to Florida, and they have no natural predators. They don't have natural predators, but they do have predators. I mean, and that's one thing that we're never going to be able to extract from the information when we find out about them because we're not going to go around and harvest birds and find out what's in their guts or harvest uh, cats or, or, you know, uh, bobcats or cougars or panthers, rather, uh, or alligators and find out how many pythons they've eaten. That is going to be a, kind of a serendipitous event where somebody documents it photographically, a, a, a wading bird eating a small python or an owl or a hawk. So those are things we don't know. We do not know the mortality from hatch to uh, adulthood, so we don't know how many of those animals survive. And the reason they produce large numbers of young at high fecundity is usually associated with animals that are, don't all make it. Mm -hmm. Rabbits do the same thing. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of reptiles produce lots of young because there's no parental care. The animals disperse from a nest and, and then they're on their own pretty much from the beginning. Another thing I found interesting is that uh, pythons, I guess, primarily lay eggs where anacondas give birth to, to live young. Is that correct? Yeah, anacondas are, are related to boa constrictors. Boa constrictors are live bearers. Pythons are, are egg layers. But they do, uh, the, the female will sit on the nest and she will help uh, keep the temperature of the nest stable. They even uh, do some muscle twitches to keep the temperature uh, uh, right and then they go out and they bask and then they come back and sit on the nest. So the nests aren't really exposed to predators unless something happens to the mother while she's sitting on it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not too many animals that are going to come up and, and uh, get into a nest with a, you know, a, a large python, a 10 or 10 foot or bigger python sitting on it. I can, yeah, I can't imagine that. Um, when they are guarding their nest, how long does it take from the birthing the eggs to the, the eggs hatching? 
We're probably around 60 days or so. And, okay. and here in late spring, we see the egg deposition. Uh, you know, breeding occurs uh, for early in spring. A little bit later in spring, we, we see egg deposition. And then early summer hatch, hatching. During the time those, period? The average size of those uh, nests is about 30, mid-30s. Uh, although they can have m many more than that. And then I think the largest uh, number, the most eggs that they found in one was in the 80s. And they can have uh, two litters of offspring a year? Usually they're doing it every two years. Usually these okay. animals are producing every two years. These are wild animals, not captive animals. Uh, so they actually have to work for their food and they tend to be a little less... Uh, a little less rotund than, than captive animals. Captive uh, animals have lots of fat reserves. These animals are healthy. The animals we find here are healthy. They are, they're doing quite well uh, because they don't need to eat a lot. You know, that, that's one of the things that helps them survive is they don't need to eat every day. So they're not actively searching for food. They may sit in an area for, uh, you know, a month and a half, two months until they get a prey item. And if they catch a big prey item, like a, a one eight, an 80 or so pound deer, it may not eat for another six months, maybe a little bit more, and it'll be fine. What is the biggest uh, python that you've encountered so far in your work? The biggest I've found at work is 14 feet. The biggest that's been caught in Florida is around 18 feet, 8 inches. And what would be the weight on a snake like that? The, the larger snake was really only around 120 pounds. It didn't have anything in its gut contents. Uh, and, you know, so their their weight varies. If they have a meal, and if you eat eighty pounds and you weigh hundred, you're gonna you're gonna weigh close to two hundred pounds with that meal while you digest it until you defecate. And that animal had nothing, no gut contents whatsoever. I think there was a, like a feather in there, and uh, you know, but it was doing well, it was finding plenty of food. It was healthy, uh, but thin. You know, one hundred and twenty pounds. Well, as I mentioned to you before the show, um, if we can bring this up for the audience, there was a graphic that I saw, which was a hypothetical diet necessary for the hatchling Burmese python to reach 13 feet in five to seven years. And just to give the audience an idea, um, as Captain Fob mentioned, they don't have to eat that often, but some of the things that it showed these animals eating, um, like four five-foot alligators. Yeah. Um, now we know they can eat up to a six-foot alligator. There's been a six-foot alligator uh, recovered from stomach contents. So uh, the, in five to seven years, that's a fair number of animals. I mean, when they're smaller, they're going to eat meals more regularly, smaller meals more regularly. And, um, and they're very efficient at converting food into body mass. I think the conversion rate is somewhere around three grams of food equals one gram of body mass. People don't reach that uh, efficiency until they're in their 40s. <laughs> These animals, I mean, it's not their fault that they are in Florida. We have been the human vector. We, they are there because of us. Um, what's concerning is I saw another study that showed that the small mammal population of the Everglades in South Florida may be down 90 plus percent as a result of the predation by these large constrictor snakes. There, there's probably a number of factors involved and probably some things uh, that will make it difficult to really tease out how much of a percentage they contribute to it. So we have a large alligator population, and these animals are going to be are hunting in very similar places uh, around the water's edge on tree islands and things. And all the animals go to the water's edge to drink, so alligators may, can be, may be consuming part of those. They did rule out some disease processes. Uh, but a water regime changes is going to change the landscape and animals are going to move around as that as a water or older lands are inundated with water. Understood. Well, they did a follow-up study just recently where they looked at rabbits only. Uh, rabbits also an animal with high fecundity. They produce lots of young and uh, they uh, radio tag them and release them. And uh, a, a fair proportion of those animals were consumed by pythons. Uh, according to their the results of their study, so they're definitely having an impact on rabbit populations. But that's why rabbit rabbits have lots of young several times a year. Certainly, okay. uh, they're 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 pretty defenseless animals. Right. I've also read because another thing that I'm interested in is the possible spread of these animals because I read that. In some cases, they're now being found in Key Largo as well. And I saw one photo, I don't know if we can show it, but of a large uh, python swimming. And, I mean, they're adept swimmers. Is that correct? They're, they're incredibly adept swimmers. They can, even hatchlings can go up to 80 days. I think the, 
the the uh, maximum amount of time is around 82 days without fresh water. Uh, that's a long time for a baby to go without water. So if they get into the salt water, they can be carried by currents to islands. Uh, Eastern Diamondbacks do that. So it, it shouldn't be a sub great surprise that they can swim well. They've been found quite a ways off of the mainland. Uh, they have been found in Key Largo, but Key Largo is pretty close and it's connected by a road to the, to the mainland. Sure. Uh, uh, they've been found pretty far off and hatchings have been found pretty far off uh, into the water swimming. Uh, one was found at least 800 feet off of, in Biscayne Bay, Biscayne National Park. And then one was sound, found south of the mainland, around uh, five miles south of the mainland, about 800 feet uh, on the western side of the, the Keys by a fisherman. Because uh, the thing that I continue to wonder is, given the propensity for them to have so many young, and obviously a lot perish, as you mentioned, um, they are apex predators, but they have some predators that prey on them. They seem to be able to go into this semi-hibernational state during cold snaps, which does kill some of them and makes them vulnerable. But I guess my question to you is, it just seems like it would be natural that they would increase their territory and spread to further states that have similar swampy, largely warm, humid areas. It'd be difficult uh, to a large degree because we do get cold spells during the winter in uh, parts of the of central Florida. So if we get hard freezes, that's going to push those populations back. That's going to knock the population back. And it's going to that's going to prevent them from expanding north. A, if you if you look, we have a subtropical temperature in the extreme southeast, south of Lake Okeechobee. Mm -hmm. But we even get hard freezes here every seven years or so, and it's even more common further north. Yes. Uh, some animals might survive that, but for the most part, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, uh, keep them in check. You know, as long as the, those temperature uh, and climate variables remain the same and we do continue to get freezes, that's going to be a check. And development to a degree, when they move out of natural areas into areas that are populated with people, they're going to be observed and removed. That's, uh, that's really not ideal either. Uh, one of the other things is, is we like to have greenways. We like to give animals ways to move from one natural area to another. So we have greenways that are relatively undeveloped. We like to have natural areas and parks, and they can use those as a, as a refuge uh, from human interference. How many days a week do you have to go out and retrieve these types of animals? Uh, it... We recover about one every three days or so, give or take, but that, that covers a number of, of, ver of species, Understood. not just Burmese pythons. And, and, most, uh, and many of what we catch are, are escaped pets uh, and, and lizards. There's uh, you know, lizards that we'll talk about later. Yeah. But uh, those form, uh, the Burmese python and the tegu are the bulk of what we respond to. And that's, uh, that's probably 90 of uh, 100 re uh, removals a year are Burmese pythons or tegus. And tegus actually are a large part of that. Today, if, if a person wants to own one of these pets, what, what is the legal standing for these types of animals and what is an owner required to do? Are they required to have them chipped? Is it, is it legal to even own these animals anymore or is, or the, is it a black in market? In the state of Florida, uh, they can be possessed as educational animals and unless you had one prior to the new rule, the rule changes, then you're grandfathered in and it's considered a conditional species. They can be kept as personal pets, except for those that were possessed prior to rule changes in 2010. After 2010, they are conditional species, which can only be kept for public display or, or public education. And they do have to be chipped, uh, and they have to have an inventory of the animals you possess. So, and that anim and, uh, inventory is turned into the state every six months. You have to fill out pr uh, permits, and you have to get a permit that costs $50 every, every year. Uh, and provide an inventory and have plans for what you're going to do if there's an emergency because we live in a hurricane prone area we stick way out in the Atlantic and hurricanes uh, blow by us every every few years some very powerful one of them at least may have been a contributor to the population in the Everglades mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, the occasional uh, potential release or or escape I heard of one store and this may be you know this, this may be rumor but I, I want to ask you about it and uh, the owner, I guess, didn't want to talk, at least in the video that I saw. I believe the store was called Strictly Reptiles. Are you familiar with that business? Yeah, that's uh, that, that probably, 
the the population tends to be centered in South Florida, and they're mm-hmm. in Broward County, so they're even north of yeah. of the the Main Park Road where the first animals were discovered. Because what I saw, at least they were being partially blamed for r- the release of some of these animals. Do you think that's even valid, or is that just scapegoating? Not the, not the ones we find in the Everglades. Okay. No, that because they're they're in. Oh, I'm trying to even think of what Hollywood, I suppose, or on and uh, Hollywood's not in the Everglades. It's north of the Everglades and east. It's almost uh, to the coast, right near the Turnpike. There's a lot of habitation in between them and the Everglades. And uh, the main population of Burmese was found far further, much further south, much further south around the main park road, which is almost, it's south of Homestead, which is south of Miami. Understood. And that's it. It's pretty far away. Okay. That might be a stretch. And, um, and to be clear, if I wanted to, if I'm a pet owner and I want a Burmese python, it is now illegal, as you said, to own it in Florida unless it is for educational purposes, Correct. And you cannot transport them across state lines um, because they're covered under the, the uh, Lacey Act as yes. an injurious species. Let me ask you this. The, uh, in 2013, the Python Challenge got a lot of press. And from what I understand, there were 1,300 registered applicants. And I don't know how, what the time period was. You can tell me if this was a week or two weeks or a month. Uh, people were allowed to come into Florida and catch these these pythons. So out of the 1,300 applicants, 68 animals were captured. And I think of those 68, several trained snake experts seemed to catch the majority of them. What is your thought on these types of efforts to make a dent in the snake population? The, the, ori- the original Python challenge was thought up as a way to uh, promote some knowledge about this, that the animals just aren't hanging from the branches. Their, their, their detection rate is very, very low. I mean, very, even for trained people, it's low. Uh, you're t- you have 3 million acres potentially for these animals to reside in, and 1,600 people, uh, only a small, less than 100 were, were trained or experienced snake hunters. Uh, that, I think the results would be what I would expect. Mm-hmm. The, the trained people had probably had more time in the field. I think you find an animal about every 20 to 24, maybe 26 hours. One animal's recovered. That's 26 hours of actual work, not just you know 26 hours of sitting on the couch. And bring Under, it back. Understood. Well, what so it's, the- it's a expensive thing, and 1,600 people. If you give them, if you give 1,600 people a uh, well, let's make it easy. I, an IKEA uh, flat pack uh, piece of furniture. You're going to have varying degrees of success of how it's put together, <laughs> right? So, and with something that's already pre-assembled. Understood. If, well, if I, you give them raw wood and and some various connecting, uh, uh, you know, connectors like bolts and nuts and screws. You might eventually get something that looks sort of like a chair from some of them, and other people, it's going to be something you can easily identify as a chair. Well, I would think that hunting uh, reticulated uh, large constricting snakes would not be something that a amateur would be particularly adept at. It, it's difficult. It's difficult. And you have to spend time in the field. I if would think all so. of those people spent 40 hours in the field a week, there would have been more snakes found. But it's also February. It's a colder period. The, the good thing is the snakes are out in the daylight during that time. But they don't have an image of what they're searching for. So their success rate is going to be low. Mm -hmm. They don't have a good idea of how to find a python in the wild. What they need is a little more experience and then they'll be better at it. There was another program called the Python Patrol in which people like yourself were teaching other uh, first responders, I believe, and other uh, civil servants how to handle these snakes. Are you still part of that program and how many people get educated in that annually? Uh, the state of Florida is is running the program now. It's previously part of the Nature Conservancy, and probably to date, it's been around seventeen hundred people or so since uh, around late two thousand six, two thousand seven. And uh, it, the more people you have that can respond and remove an animal, the better success you're going to have at removing them. 
Because if you have to wait until the next day to go look for the animal, it's not going to be there. If you can get somebody there in a, in a relatively short amount of time, 20 minutes, a half an hour, the animal may remain there. Uh, because they depend on their camouflage to protect them from predation. Mm -hmm. And if a person sees it and keeps their distance and can just watch it, we can see where the animal goes and we can, a lot of times we can just remove it. Uh, our success rate here for people that actually stay and watch the animal is quite good. Uh, I think we're close to 90% removal, successful removal of an animal if the person watches it. If they're driving by on the road, all bets are off. Sure. The animal go anywhere in that 30 minutes but if a person is observing it then it, the success rate increases greatly and unfortunately I'm guessing that those animals have to be euthanized the, yes uh, they I mean it, they're potentially large animals they sure. could be uh, you know 10 or 15 feet and who can take one that really doesn't really want to be around people and is exceptionally grumpy there's liability issues they're the the ownership's restricted already so finding homes for them is difficult uh, the state does have a, a pet amnesty program where people can um, turn in their animals without consequence, and then they, they're sent to uh, certified adopters. And uh, that's a great program because it gives people an outlet for an animal that they can no longer feel they can care for. I do not want to hurt the feelings of, of, of reptile owners. I have friends who own reptiles, but I think that a lot of people naively think they're going to be Slash or Alice Cooper and they're going to go buy a small constrictor snake and it's going to be cool and then that animal continues to grow and they realize they can't handle it so they let it free in their backyard or whatever which is a terribly irresponsible thing to do not only for us and the environment for, but for the snake itself and listen I I feel for the snakes that the animal is only doing what the animal needs to do. It's trying to flourish. It's trying to propagate. So I guess I, I wish that people that found these types of pets fascinating would do their research because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a commitment, as is any pet. It is. It's a huge commitment. And it's a huge commitment in time. They're long lived. If you get a bunny rabbit or a guinea pig, they're not going to live for 20 years and potentially 30 years. And they're not going to get that size, and they're going to eat an easily available food item. You know, interestingly enough, a group of people who we would think would not do uh, release non-native species in the environment, it was just uh, teachers. And what they found is that teachers have a pet in the class, a you know, turtle or whatever, and at the end of the year, they uh, said, what are you going to do with it? Well, some of them would let it go. And it was a much larger percentage than you would have ever imagined. I can't remember. I wish I could find the, the study again or the, or the little poll that they took. But it was alarming. And these are people who are educated. You know, they're not, uh, they don't have bad intentions, but what they do is has an impact on the environment. Uh, and it's not just the animal itself. There's a potential for disease transmission, which we see with frogs and chytrid fungus uh, and, and, and plants that we move around. And the plants uh, have a huge impact on agriculture. Uh, here now in South Florida, we have uh, uh, a laurel wilt disease that affects avocados, which is a $28 million industry in South Florida. And that was a disease brought in from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and, a per, and a pest that came with it, an ambrosia beetle, which now we know that our native beetles are also a vector for the disease. So there, it's not just their presence and their consumption of animals, which if it's a small population can be, uh, you know, animals can adapt to it because the, the environment has some plasticity in it. It is, you know, the potential for disease transmission, com competing with animals that are already threatened, feeding on animals that are already threatened. Um, you know, they, they cannot be here without some impact, just like we can't be here without some impact. Right. And this is largely as a result of our impact, which takes me to the next set of animals, because in the early 2000s, I uh, met a family who run a pet kind of rehab here in Los Angeles, and they 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 try to take in pets that people uh, abandon and also the illegal pet trade they try to intercept those animals coming in and they told me something that has stayed with me ever since and they said michael what do you think the third most abandoned pet is and i'm like wow i, I don't know i want to see a dog cat and they said iguanas which brings us to these large lizards because in florida you also have an issue with uh, these tegus which you mentioned earlier iguanas and these nile monitors tell me a little bit about them Iguanas have been here for a, a, quite a long time. They were around probably 70s all the way up through now, maybe even earlier. Populations are quite high. Um, 
but they're more of a nuisance than they are an environmental threat. We don't see them in natural areas. We don't see them out in the Everglades, probably from they get consumed when they're small by predatory animals. The Everglades has, has a pretty wide array of predators. Mm -hmm. The tegus, on the other hand, we have, they're like a furless raccoon. They, uh, where they come from, they, they, they live by human habitation. They get in people's garbage. They compete with their dogs and cats for food. Uh, make a general nuisance to themselves. They show up in their yards, and uh, people consider them generally menacing. They're smart. They're diurnal. They uh, they're active. So they eat everything. They eat every day. They they eat eggs. So that's a particular problem here because we all have a lot of ground nesting birds and a lot of ground nesting animals, including alligators and crocodiles, that they could go get in those nests and, and consume. And they actually have video of uh, tegu consuming eggs from an alligator nest. So that, that's a potential problem, and some of our turtles and tortoises that are, that are uh, uh, and threatened with, uh, by development and other things. This is just an additional uh, pressure on those animals to survive. And these animals are, are like coyotes in the sense that they, they actually can thrive near an urban, urban area. Oh yeah, they do quite well in the in the in the urban interface, in the suburban urban interface, and suburban wildland interface. They do quite well. They they actually there's a, a few um, uh, manufactured home parks, and they live under the houses. They come out when they want to eat, and they nest right there and in the neighborhood, and make a general nuisance of themselves. And people find them quite disturbing to have a two or three foot lizard running through their yard. Certainly, they're incredibly fast, so capture is difficult. The good thing is, is those animals can be trapped. Because unlike a python, which may sit in a spot for 45 days or, or two months or so, uh, they have to eat every day. So you can put a trap there, and then there's a few, a few bait items that are quite effective at capturing them. Understood. One of the stories that I read uh, back in 2010 when you mentioned that cold snap, and, and at first it had all the hallmarks of an urban legend, but I think this was true, that in Miami these iguanas were falling out of trees because I guess they go into a mild hibernative state when it gets cold yeah. in that cold snap, and then they were falling out of trees? Yeah, they go into a torpor, and um, unfortunately for them, they climb a tree to try and uh, for protection, and trees are terrible for protection from cold because you're more of your body surface area is exposed to the cold air. There's no insulation. The temperature drops there, especially if there's some dew formation. Uh, so they get chilled, they fall out of the trees because they lose their grip. They just get stiff and fall, fall to the ground. It was an amazing story. When I first read it, it I, like I, I thought, is this, is this real? And um, so it was humorous to me, uh, but it's not great for the iguanas, obviously. So ultimately, Florida, apparently, according to the sources that I keep encountering, has the claim to being the place with the most invasive animal species on the planet right now. Oh, probably. Probably where they keep records. There may be a place that doesn't keep records, but maybe not a lot of people go there and bring stuff with them. Uh, so we have a fair number of reptile species, some mammals, uh, fish. There's a, a host of fish that have been introduced into our canal systems. The good thing is, is they're not going to make it too far out of here. Probably with cold weather, that'll kill them as well. And uh, even in our ocean, we have lionfish in the ocean here. Well, we're going to wrap this thing up. I guess my final question to you is because you, you deal with these animals daily. Um, is the cat out of the bag? I mean, I, I, don't, I fail to see or it's, I'm skeptical that these animals can be eradicated from these places where they don't belong. I mean, it just seems like they're here to stay. Is that correct? Or Once an animal has been established and has a healthy population, eradication is difficult. And when, you, when I say 3 million acres, those 3 million acres are relatively untrammeled wilderness where we probably use, I'll say, generously 10% of the land area. And uh, if they're in the center of that, removing them from that location is uh, near impossible. Uh, without some other factor being involved, the, the eradication of these animals is going to be difficult. Or I don't like to say impossible because who knows, we may come up with some magic silver bullet. I, don't, I, I somehow doubt it. I think what we're going to do is it's now a management issue. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to manage the population. And we're especially where they encounter people. We're especially going to have to keep... And that's what the Python Patrol is for. And some of these other 
efforts and removal efforts that go on is is to manage the population where there's an interface where there's some interaction with humans uh not so much of the threat but because that is where we're going to find them understood that's where, where people are and the snakes are that's where you're going to get them it's serendipity if you go out of the everglades and you drive around uh or walk around uh being in three million acres and in the same place with uh, an animal you're looking for uh, with a few exceptions is luck it's it's luck. So if you're looking for pythons, they can spread out over a huge land area, and finding an animal that has about a one percent detection rate is lucky. I understand, Captain Bob. Thank you so much for coming on the show and and sharing your knowledge with us. We commend the work that you do there in Florida, and uh, wish you continued success in in your job. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I hope I uh, answered all your questions. You certainly did. We appreciate this. My name has been Michael Parker. This has been Antidote. If you like what we do here, please subscribe to our channels on YouTube for Lip TV and Lip TV 2. You can also find my show on Facebook, We Are Antidote. Until next week, remember, you, me, we, all of us together, we are the antidote. I'm out.